Thank you, Tadeusz. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for such initiative uh, in the National Library of Israel. And thank you for inviting me. Uh, I'm extremely honored to be here today and to have an opportunity to present a bit of my research to you all, and as well as to present to you about the history of Jewish communities in Ukraine. And today I'm dedicating my uh, lecture to my museum colleagues in Ukraine, who since February 24th, the beginning of full-scale invasion of Russia against Ukraine, despite all struggles and air raids, try to keep the museum collection collections they care about in safe and secure place. To those colleagues who became volunteers to help civilians and the, mili the military by providing shelter and ammunition. To those colleagues who had to evacuate from the country, leaving behind almost everything and looking for the new meanings now. And especially for those colleagues uh, who have to put aside their research work and to protect uh, our country and our families. Today, I would like to present to you a bit about the golden age of Jewish printing in Ukraine, about some significant persons and events, uh, sometimes dramatic events, uh, that outline the development uh, not, of, not only of the printing industry, but also of the Jewish community itself, uh, about uh, practices of reading and ownership and about some significant uh, Jewish book collections in Ukraine that nowadays are carried and studied by my colleagues and myself. Uh, now I will start with my presentation. Just a bit. Um, yeah. um, I believe that books, especially since inventing, uh, are our trustworthy companions. Book accompanied uh, Jewish people in times of joy and in, time of, in times of struggle. Um, but what, before we start with the Jewish printing, history of Jewish printing in Ukraine, let us see very briefly how it started in general. Jewish printed, uh, start, printing started in Italy in the mid 15th century and this wonderful invention was called at the time the crown of the old science. The very first Jewish book was printed in 1475 in Reggio de Calabria in Italy. Jewish printing presses was established in many, many places uh, within a very short time. Italy was the earliest and the largest center of Jewish book production. And then printing houses were established across Europe and a bit later in the Ottoman world. In 1513, um, Jewish printing began in Central Europe, in Prague. 20, year, uh, 20 years later, the disciples of um, Prague printer Gershon Ben Shlomo uh, Hakoyen moved to Krakow, from uh, Prague to Krakow. Uh, well, they received a license from the Sigismund I, the king, and they published their first work, um, Share Dura. They continue uh, to publish Jewish books even after they converted to Christianity. And this decision of these printers brought a boycott on them by Jews. Jewish communities. Um, refused to buy Jewish books printed by those printers. In the end, the king uh, ordered, we know from, this, from his order that he ordered the communities of Krakow, Poznan and Lviv in Ukrainian lands to buy all the books from these uh, printing houses. Thus, we know uh, that before Jewish printing began in Ukrainian lands, Jewish communities bought the books they need uh, from uh, printers from Europe. In Ukrainian lands, Jewish communities grow and they 
uh, here was a very promising uh, market in economical meanings for uh, public in for printers and published Jewish pub publisher. The very first Jewish publishing house in Ukraine was established in Zhokva, in the western parts of Ukraine, in 1692. This year marked when a Jewish printing started its history in, on Ukrainian land. The press was founded by uh, the, an Amsterdam printer, Uri Ben Aharon Fivesh. Uh, the Fivesh family um, printed works, books in virtually every genre. Publications of this printing, of, I'll show you the book actually I have here. This book was printed in Jokva and publications of this printing uh, are not worthy for its title pages. Uh, on the title pages of books printed in Jokva by, by uh, this Amsterdam printer uh, was noted that the book was printed in Amsterdam fonts uh, with the word Amsterdam, like here, uh, in large letters. Uh, and in much smaller letters, it was indicated that the actual place of printing was Zhokva, here. In 1782, the Austrian authorities ordered the Jewish printer, printers of Zhokva to move to Lviv, uh, to facilitate censorship. Until then, Lviv had no Jewish printing. Since that move, uh, it quickly became a printing center for Jewish books, and they, the books here was distributed, or from here was distributed uh, in Europe and the Balkans. One of the most significant printers in Zhokva and lately in Lviv was Judith Roza uh, Rosanes. A great granddaughter of Uri Ben Aharon Fivesh, the same printer who had come to Zhokva in 1692 from Amsterdam. She printed uh, with her husband in, in Zhokva uh, with, uh, um, with her husband David Mann before his death. In 1782, she moved to Lviv and established her uh, printing business uh, here. Um, in Lviv, she married Ra Rabbi uh, Hush Rosanes, Rabbi of the city and the great scholar. Altogether, Judith uh, Rosanes printed at least 50 books before her death in 1805. The name of Judith Rosanes was so famous as a printer of Jewish books that in the middle of the 19th century, almost more than uh, 100 years after her death, when the authorities forbade uh, the publication of Hasidic books, printers used her name on the title pages to show that the books was, uh, has been printed uh, much earlier. The printing, printing house uh, in Jokra and later in Lviv enjoyed uh, the mon monopoly until the end of the 18th century. In 1760, uh, new presses was established in Oleksinet and then Jewish printers, uh, mainly with small presses emerged in the following years in, much, in such places all over Ukra Ukrainian land, in such places as uh, Lutsk, um, uh, Polonia, Slavuta, Minkovci, and Ostroch. And also, it should be no, uh, mentioned that uh, Jewish presence was also opened in the Crimea Peninsula, in Chukut Kale, and Yevpatoria. Uh, Crimean Karaites published their uh, religious books there. Um, but here I would like to talk uh, in more detail about one place of Jewish painting. Minkovsky, and about one very eccentric person whose support for Jewish printing there was recognized on the title pages of Hebrew books printed there, Ignacy Stibor Machotsky. Uh, he was not a Jew, but a Polish noble, 
Stephen Malkowski proclaimed his state, Minkowski, as an independent state. Uh, he liberated his serfs and uh, gave all the people the same rights, no matter of origin or religion. Jews had exactly the same rights as the other civil, as the citizens had. Um, Tibor Marchotsky admired the ideas of a French Enlightenment, and that's why he paid great attention to printing. The Minkovci had their own printing house uh, since 70, um, uh, 1781. They, they need to print laws, instructions, and banknotes. And in the same year, uh, the Jewish printing was established there as well. The printers, and this uh, was Yeheskel Ben Shabak, and the owners of the Jewish printing houses, house were local Jews, Yosef and his son Moshe, and his names we could also find here on the title page of this book. Um, the circulation of the books uh, in Minkowski was uh, near and they were mostly unprofitable. But the Marchotsky favored uh, Jewish publishers, believing that the books uh, glorified Minkowski as almost the main center of Jewish book printing in Podolia region in, U in Ukrainian in Ukraine, Ukrainian lands here, yeah, the Podolia region. This fascinating story ended after 30 years when the Russian Empire closed down the Minkovsky state and imprisoned Tibor Mahotsky, uh, accusing him for conspiracy against the state, since his son participated in the Polish uprising. Um, Jewish printing presses sprang in more uh, than 50, uh, 15 towns or, and often uh, several presses were in one town. This had several reasons, mostly because of changing uh, legal economic environment in which state and local elites sought to restrict their import of Jewish books and encourage local uh, production of books. In addition, the rising uh, of local demand for Hebrew and Yiddish texts, demographic explosion, and religious ferment. However, many publishing houses it did not succeed in the long run. What those printing houses were like? A, print, a printing house uh, was we call today, uh, what we may call today, a small family business. The same was true uh, for the printing houses in Europe since the invention of printing, and we already saw this uh, in the story about the Yudit Rosanes in Joko and Liv. The owners of this business work from home. The accessories, instruments, and machinery uh, was uh, fit inside a single room uh, or wing of a house. Paper was bought only for the immediate use. Some printers used more than one machine, yet mm, most of them had no premises specially designed for the printing uh, shop. Many of for the uh, printed houses were very small, some publishing no more than a few books. So what they were printing? Some of these printers published canonical and specialized uh, works of religious practice. Talmudic tractates, responsa, halachic codes, codes, the classic of Kabbalah, and commentaries on biblical, Talmudic, and halachic issues. But the economic uh, basis of Jewish printing was text for ritual and household use, uh, such as prayer books, uh, humash, tahilim, haggadah, and calendars. And in fact, calendars was the bestsellers of those uh, printing houses. Uh, more specialized and expensive Jewish books, especially Hasidic, 
uh, were often brought to printers by the authors and printed uh, at the expense of authors. Short lived uh, presses seem to have been established uh, exactly for this purpose to bring mystical esoteric work to the public and in order to popularize the Hasidic work. An example for this was the short lived printing houses founded by a, follow, by a follower of Nachman of Bratislav, Nathan uh, Sternhardt of Nemiro, who um, established a printing, a printing house especially to, to disseminate the rabbis, the rabbis' work. In the 19th century, the printing of popular books in Yiddish in case. These include, uh, included Sakram in Hadgin, the Tane Urana, and the Yusipon. Um, also, some of, the, uh, some of the printers were followers of various themes in Jewish religious life. Um, but the main reason for publishing was economic. For example, Sigir uh, Shmargaliot published the anti Hasidic work in 1772 and Eight years later, uh, he published also the first Hasidic book, uh, Tolot Yaakov Yosef. However, ideological commitments and conflicts uh, did influence uh, printing practice. With few exceptions, the publishers of Misnagdik and did not publish Hasidic books. And, and this practice was common until the later half of the 19th century. Ukrainian lands um, at the time were, was under the rule of several states. The Ukrainian, the Russians and Habsburg tried to exert some control over the production, distribution, and content of Jewish books. Each applied uh, censorship to each of the states applied uh, censorship to Jewish books, banned some books um, with. Um, superstitious content, meaning Hasidic and Kabbalistic, uh, first of all, and try to limit uh, import. All, th all this altogether, tensions between uh, Hasidic and Isnagdi groups, uh, Matkalim, suspic state suspicion, suspicion against Jewish subjects, overwhelming growth of the Jewish printing industry, and consequently the rivalry between printing houses which once parked in 1935 uh, led to dramatic changes. This park was uh, a Slavuta state. Uh, here is the book uh, pub, uh, printed in Slavuta by the very uh, famous uh, Shapiro family. Moshe Shapira established a large press in 1791. And this prayer, his, um, his family specialized in handsome edition uh, of religious books. Magnificent editions of the Talmud printed in Flavuta are in particular frame and was recognized very highly outside um, the Russian Empire as well. In 1834, Menachem Menrom from Vilna began to publish a rival edition of the Talmud. The Slavuta printers uh, considered this edition from Vilna as a violation of their exclusive rights to publish the Talmud for 25 years. Um, and great dispute was issued because of that. Dozens of rabbis from all parts of Europe were involved and in a geological and social tension between Hasidim who supported uh, the printers of Slavuta and Miknadim, uh, who supported the Vilna printers, become tougher. In 1835, when the controversy was at, at its height, the Slavuta printing press was closed down by the uh, Russian authorities after the brothers uh, Shapiro has been accused of the death of the bookbinder working for them. That's how the author of the Golden Age title describes this event. Um, the town clerks, police, and district doctor determined to, uh, that it was a suicide. Local Jews 
also supported the, the version that the protagonist had come to a bad end because of his uh, depression and heavy, heavy drinking. The general governor appointed a special commission to investigate the case, and the commission arrived to this, at the same conclusion. This event was brought to the Kiev uh, military court. The, judge, the judges considered Hasidim as a set guilty of the most hideous anti-governmental belief. Accusers proved that pretending this bookbinder of Sabuta printing house was supposedly wanted to denounce to the authorities the anti-governmental and anti-Christian motives in the newly published printed Slavuta editions of the Talmud, Shulchan Aruch, and uh, other Hasidic books. The judges charged Shmuel Abba and Pinchas Shapira with homicide, along with their father, Moshe Shapira. Shapira brothers spent about 15 years imprisoned in Moscow, and also in uh, 1836, Nicholas I ordered to close off the Slavuta press and all the existing Jewish presses uh, that were at the time. Only two were, uh, was allowed, one in Kiev and one in Vienna, under the strictest government, governmental surveillance and censorship. The one, the printing house that was uh, supposed to be active in Kiev uh, later was transferred to, uh, actually was opened in Zhitomer. The, the Slavuta case uh, had a devastating effect on the Jewish printing industry. The book trade uh, went from free to internal contraband. The governmental uh, ban was lifted in, 19, in 1862 and Jewish printing was uh, removed in um, such cities as Berdychev, Odessa, Lviv in Ukrainian land. Um, and with that, uh, the golden age of uh, Jewish printing in Ukrainian land um, has come to its end. And here is briefly about the uh, Jewish printing in Ukraine, because now I would like to suggest to move from the printers to other people who uh, connect the, the, the books at very close range, the readers and owners. Um, and here, is it possible uh, to ask to know something about readers about of books that were printed in all those places all over U Ukraine that I've mentioned before? Should we go to archive to look for some document? Um, how about we start with the book itself? Uh, when we saw a book in a museum or a library collection, what do we expect to see when we open this book? The text, yes, but there also could be some additional and very amazing findings. Now I'd like to present uh, to and to present to you uh, my own piece of uh, research. For my MA and PhD thesis, I'm studying the Jewish book, printed book collection that is now uh, stored in Communist Kudinsky State Historical Museum Archive, uh, Museum Reserve. The collection consisted of 665 Jewish printed books. According to the bibliographic list, um, all those books were printed in Hebrew in the period from the late. 18th century, so 1913 in different cities and countries. Up to 1930s, those books belong to various Jewish uh, organiza religious organizations or was the part of the personal or private libraries of members of Jewish communities in, U in Communist Podilski. In books, we, uh, we could find a lot of book plays archival stands, marginalia, and handwritten notes. And all these altogether can provide us some valuable information about the Jewish community in Kampodiski 
about practices of readership and ownership. The most common and obvious booklet is the one that uh, marks ownership of this uh, of the book. In those examples, uh, we can see the book plate that indicate that the books uh, belong to the libraries, library collections of certain religious institutions in communist Podilsky. Uh, and here, uh, book plates that indicate that Havrod also had their own book collections. We may assume that members of those Havrod also, also they were members of the same congregation, have their own um, book collection and they buy, uh, buy, buy bought the needed books from, for their circle. Of course, there are also examples of um, book plates that indicate the owner's name and uh, that and we know that the book belongs to the private or personal library. And if in case if you talking about the religious institutions, book plates are usually made on, or almost in every case they made in uh, Hebrew. Uh, the text in Hebrew, but uh, for the personal or private collections, book plates uh, may was made as uh, text of book plates made or in Hebrew um, and sometimes in Russian. Um, sometimes we can find uh, inscription saying that the book was um, a gift from a certain person um, to the library of Beit Midrash or Clois. And um, sometimes there is a book plate that indicate that um, book came to the library collection uh, in memoriam of the lay person, like in this example. Um, all these uh, also help researchers uh, to establish the ways of, uh, of how the libraries of those religious institu uh, institutions was uh, gathered, and books were bought, they were, gift uh, they were gifted, and they were transferred there as commemoration practice. Uh, sometimes uh, readers of books also use book books not only as a source of knowledge, but also as notebooks for uh, quick notes, um, places to try the signature or quill, and uh, even a sketch pad when some, something around them was uh, really boring. Um, I would like to show you two examples of handwritten notes that could tell us something uh, a bit more about the readers. And at the same time, the, those examples arose uh, a lot of uh, much more uh, research question. And an interesting, interesting, the first note, um, handwritten note, uh, we do not know who made it, uh, was made inside of uh, the one, uh, the Talmud tractate, in this case, the Ruby. Um, and if we saw closely to this, um, poem, and I could read you one um, line here, od love da tikvateino. Uh, it is one of the version uh, of the poem that we know today as Hatikva. At the end of uh, 19th century, uh, in communist Podilsky, there were a lot of uh, Zionist organizations. So, was the unknown reader who made this, uh, who wrote down this poem, uh, a supporter of uh, Zionist organization or participant? Um, he was. What was his purpose of uh, writing down uh, this uh, poem inside the Talmud tractate? Um, this also reminds me of the story about described by. by Jeffrey Weinzinger in his book, Jewish Public Culture in the Late 18, in the Late Russian Empire. From the book, as he wrote from the books of mem memoirs and in school books, when it is known that 
in the late of 19th century, uh, not only religious books were read in the Beit Midrash, Klois, and at the Havorot meetings. Yeshiva students and other Jews bring broad secular Jewish and Russian language uh, books and uh, in the, to religious schools and read them. They're covering those secular books uh, with Talmudic, with tractates. Maybe it also was uh, in this case that happened here. Um, another fascinating story about a Jewish read, book reader and owner is here. In, and now in this case, we know the name of the uh, book owner because he made the inscription uh, for, for us to know that. Uh, his name is Ella Reutemann. And he was a student uh, in the city college, uh, presumably in Kamenetz Podilski. In addition to this uh, inscription about with his name, he made a warning note against stealing his book. Um, was it common between students to steal each other's book? or it was made just for fun because we know that some books from uh, Beit Midrash, Klois, Yeshiva, they were stolen in the inventory list from Belarusian uh, Beit Midrash and Volozhin. We, uh, we can see that uh, near the title of some books, they're also marked stolen. And uh, it was, the, quite common, uh, much common than we could imagine. All those uh, book plates and handwritten inscriptions are great source to study the Jewish uh, readers and owners. Uh, those stories uh, also could make us think about our own, our own attitude toward books. And here's the question to all of you to think about lately. Um, I'm pretty sure that all of you definitely have many, many books uh, in your possessions. And what kind of stories uh, your books will tell about its people? And for the last part of my presentation today, I would like to um, present you a bit of modern and uh, fascinating collections and gatherings, gatherings of Jewish printed books in Ukraine. I will uh, mention here only two, three institutions. Uh, and, and here I, must, I also have to say that in Ukraine, the insanely rich collections uh, in the museums and libraries. However, in with some exceptions, uh, they have not yet been studied. One of the most rich and uh, fascinating collections is in the Vernadsky National Library of Ukraine. The, the collection of Jewish manuscripts and printed books uh, has almost uh, has more than 140 items, and that includes more than 8,000 8, uh, manuscripts, more than uh, 30,000 periodicals and more than 80,000 books. The treasure of the Judaic and Jewish collection of the, uh, the collections of Pinkasim, most of them originate in Ukraine. The collection of Jewish musical folklore uh, with uh, authentic records uh, made by Ansky and Bergowski during their expeditions and also the collection of uh, Yiddish uh, publications of the Soviet period. Um, among the Jewish printed books editions, there are the earliest uh, editions of uh, European uh, Jewish printed houses, uh, Venice, Sanchino, Amsterdam, and uh, also there is a book published in Ukrainian printed houses that I mentioned today, 
uh, those printed houses in Slavuta, Zhitomir, uh, Oleksiny, Roka, and so on. Many, uh, many Jewish studies scholars and researchers uh, already visited the Ukrainian, the Bernatsky National Library of Ukraine for their research. Uh, here on the photo, you can see students from the National Ukraine, National University of Kyiv Academy, uh, who are studying their Jewish studies. And uh, in this photo is my two my colleagues, Irina Sergeyeva, uh, in the middle, who was the head of the department, uh, Judaica department, until her birth in 2019, and Tatiana Batanova, very famous and uh, prominent. Uh, Jewish studies scholar and Yiddish studies scholar in Ukraine. Another library that has more than 7 million titles in hold holdings, and uh, of which at least 6,000 are Jewish books, is Krolenko Kharkiv State Scientific Library. Um, in 2020, two years ago, the Center for Study of internet relations in Eastern Europe uh, has launched the project, uh, FIFRA project, uh, to catalog the books in the Jewish books. The center plans to uh, create a database of Jewish books in Kharkiv libraries. But since the Russian full scale invasion, the project has been paused. And researchers had to evacuate from the center, and library staff had to uh, evacuate from the city. On March 13, uh, the Krolenko Kharkiv State uh, Library was damaged by a Russian bomb bombing. Uh, the book collections at the time um, were not damaged, but the, um, it still can happen. And the last uh, major uh, collection I would like to mention today is from the book chamber of Ukraine. Uh, among their collections, the magnificent collection of books in Yiddish printed in the first half of 20th century. And also there are many, many collections in small uh, or larger uh, museums and libraries like the one I'm studying currently in the Kanez Podilsky uh, State uh, Historical Museum Reserve. And all those collections are waiting for their uh, researchers uh, to be studied, to be carefully examined and to be presented to the public. Uh, that is um, my third very brief presentation about the history of Golden Age history of Jewish printing in Ukraine, about people who read them, uh, and about our magnificent collections in Ukraine. Thank you. Uh, and now I would love to hear all your questions and comments. And um, I hope this uh, presentation was uh, yeah. enjoyable. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much, Nadia, for this fascinating uh, lecture and presentation. Yes, we do have a few questions, but uh, before I would read them, let me ask you something which I also wanted to ask, uh, and on behalf of the library, and I guess uh, at least part of the audience. Uh, could you please tell us a bit about um, Jewish studies in Ukraine, in modern Ukraine. I, I suppose this is a, a broader subject, which which probably is even the the subject for a separate uh, lecture. But could you briefly briefly say a few words about how Jewish studies looks now, or before the war? I mean, yeah, um, the two my two major centers of Jewish studies in Ukraine now is in Kiev. Uh, National University of Kiev Mohyl Academy uh, and the uh, Ukrainian Catholic University in Lviv. Uh, so there are two uh, master programs in Jewish studies that are currently active in Ukraine, uh, but we also have other uh, centers uh, that um, create a network and um, uh, help researchers in Jewish studies 
to um, discuss their research, the exchange the ideas. Like the one of the center is uh, I mentioned already the center of of internet uh, relations in Eastern Europe. Uh, in, um, so we the. Jewish studies in Ukraine actually um, a very young um, study um, studies you can say so uh, in Ukraine National University of Chief Mohila Academy of a master program was launched in 2010 uh, so it's 10 10 years of, of the first uh, uh, of first students who graduated the program. As well, the Ukrainian Association of Jurist uh, um, colleagues and um, I appreciate it. Uh, thank you, Tadish, for mentioning it in the beginning. Uh, uh, and then also would like to um, remind the to the um, those who listen. Uh, actually, but thank I uh, think to you, Tadeusz, uh, that you mentioned in the beginning about this and the of uh, Ukrainian Association for Jewish Studies, and that we are trying to support uh, our colleagues and gathering as well as money to. Uh, help uh, families, especially those who have to, uh, who now protect uh, our country. Uh, so I would like also to remind uh, our listeners here and our audience about this link that you shared in the beginning. Uh, yes, thank you. I will I will share it again. Uh, let me just read the few questions we got. Uh, I think the connection with you, it's, it's, it's worse at the moment, but I will still read it and hope it will somehow improve within, uh, within a short time. So uh, Natalie Medvinsky, uh, first of all, he's saying uh, uh, good evening to you. And he would like to ask, how do you preserve the Jewish manuscripts during the airstrikes or generally how the institutions are preserving the collection during airstrikes. Um, I will tell very little about this since I'm not in Ukraine. I'm not the librarian or museum worker, but and also it's because of um, security measurements. But uh, all uh, our colleagues they have their protocol, so they are trying to. Um, in some sometimes, if it's possible to uh, protect, to move the collections if, uh, to a safer place or protect it uh, in any possible way. So, uh, sorry, it's really the, because of um, security issues. Yes, of course, we understand it. Okay, um, I will read another question which um, was asked at the very beginning by Igor Bodun. Uh, Nadia, thank you for your research and the work you have done. May I ask what percentage of the books published at this period you were speaking about uh, is, we, is dealing with religious topics from the Torah? Do you know uh, the answer? Like how, how uh, which percentage of the printed books uh, is dealing with religious, purely religious things from the Torah? Um, if we're talking about the begin, uh, beginning of the printing and until the, I think in, until the 19th century, the most, uh, I can't say it per, per, uh, percentage, but the most publishing, published uh, publications uh, in, in some, it was dealing with the religious, it was religious books. Uh, 
different genres, but uh, the secular literature uh, became more popular and increased in uh, production in the 19th century, actually. Um, but even, even if we talk about uh, the previous more early times, uh, even if it's voice some fascinating story uh, for about some adventures, it was based on uh, topics uh, from Torah. So uh, it's really um, if it, um, but the to exact accurate percentage, you know, it's really hard to say. Also because. Not all the books preserved, not all the, uh, we do not know much uh, more, uh, many about those books, actually. We know about those, uh, those books that were preserved and we could study them and now in our collections. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um... I would like to actually we uh, we have some comments many people wrote thank you very much for your fascinating uh, lecture I would like to ask if anyone from the audience uh, has any more questions so please do ask do write or please raise your hand and I will uh, unmute you or if you would like to ask um, please raise your hand and I will unmute you so this is the last call for any question. Okay, I don't see there is any hand up. Okay, Nadia, therefore, um, okay, Miriam is sending thanks. Thank you very much as well. Nadia, it was really a great pleasure to host you. Um, and uh, thank you again for this wonderful uh, presentation. If there will be any more questions which people will send uh, by email, so I will uh, forward you. And uh, first of all, good luck with your uh, research. Thank you. Uh, good luck in Bulgaria, and I hope you will be able to come back to your home country really soon. And, uh, and thank you all for coming and attending and hope to see you uh, hope to see you again. I'm sorry, Doris Ruth Strauss is asking, Doris, if you click on the link I sent, on the right side, there is a blue bottom register. So you click there and you can register for the next lecture as well. I hope this is clear. I will also pass it again. So, uh, Okay. Okay. I, Thank you. You, I, you would like to add something? <laughs> for the end, because I saw in this chat a new Ortiz. I'm sorry with the name. I uh, uh, write in my books as well. And some people do not appreciate it, but there's uh, my personal note. And um, here's I fully support you. Because, and I did not mention this in my presentation, but sometimes people shocked when they found those uh, inscriptions or uh, drawings, uh, doodles in religious books, especially. Uh, but um, I'm fully in support you to make such uh, inscriptions. It's okay, in my opinion. But I also have uh, this um, uh, request uh, in by thinking of the future re researchers who may study your book, please do uh, those inscriptions uh, very clear, so it could be easily read. But I really thank you, thank you for today today's invitation and for uh, this opportunity to present my uh, research and speak about Ukraine and Ukrainian history. Thank you very much, Nadia, again. Thank you all for uh, coming and attending and have a good evening or afternoon if you are in the United States. Thank you, Nadia. Thank you.